anti-vaxxers pretty much never come up with anything new. And recently, in dark, stinky corners of the internet, there have been claims about DNA contamination in COVID vaccines. This again is nothing new. It is recycled anti-vaccine garbage that has always been around for as long as vaccines have. Hey, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist and welcome to another COVID debunking video. So yeah, today I'm going to be tackling this claim that there is DNA contamination in COVID vaccines. But first, I want to cover some background on this topic. What you need to understand before learning why these claims are wrong is a little bit about how vaccines and other biologic drugs are made. All biological drugs, including vaccines, have a step in their manufacturing that uses cells. These can be mammalian cells, these can be bacterial cells, depends on the product and what is needed. For example, to make insulin, which is needed to keep diabetics all over the world alive, you need bacterial cells that are genetically engineered to produce human insulin. Once the human insulin is made, all the bacteria and all the parts of the bacteria are separated away from the insulin, and the insulin is the drug product. Another example are polio vaccines. In order to get a polio vaccine, you need the virus, and the virus is grown in cells. But just like the insulin, the virus needs to be taken away from the cells and all of the cells' parts in order to make the actual vaccine product. Whatever the case may be, there are a slew of long-established tests that are done to ensure that your drug product has actually been removed from the cell's parts. There are tests that are designed to look for how much host cell DNA is left in the drug product after you have finished making it. Same with host cell proteins or bacterial endotoxin and several other things. All of these tests are required by regulatory laws to be done on each and every lot of biological drug that goes out onto the market. And there are set limits as to how much residual material can be found in those drug products. These are very strict guidelines that pharmaceutical companies have to abide by. In addition to good manufacturing procedure, which is abbreviated GMP, we also have a good documentation procedure and good lab procedures. All of this can be summarized as just GXP. So moving forward, I'll be referring to all of these guidelines as GXP. If any of those GXP guidelines are not met or there are deviations from their protocols, then that is a huge no-no and it would result in the lot not even going out in the first place or being recalled or a number of other things, including fines and disciplinary actions against those responsible. So it's kind of a big deal, which is why there are many layers to these regulations. The pharmaceutical company itself is required to do in-house testing to show that their product meets all of these regulations. And the regulatory body, in this case for the U.S. being the FDA, will double check those results meaning that they can perform their own testing in their own labs. And furthermore, when those drugs go out to other countries, those other countries' own regulatory bodies will also do in-house testing on the products that they receive. Again, by the end of it, the levels of residual host cell protein, DNA, whatever, have to be below a certain set limit. Anything below that certain set limit is considered to be trace amounts. And in those trace amounts, these materials will not have a biological effect on whoever receives the drug. So in other words, if there is no biological effect being exerted by these materials in these trace amounts, then for all intents and purposes, they might as well not be there. So that's what we mean when we say, no, there is no contamination in these materials. But other people seem to think that they've found differently, and it's quite a funny story, so let's get into it. So when it comes to COVID mRNA vaccines, some people who have a history of subscribing to anti-vaccine kind of deranged conspiracy theories claim to have found plasmid DNA in the mRNA vaccines. What is plasmid DNA, you might ask? Well, it comes from the manufacturing process used in making mRNA vaccines. A plasmid is a circular piece of DNA that can be taken up by things like bacteria and then expressed, meaning that the DNA can be read by cellular machinery and made into mRNA. Once the mRNA is made, the DNA is chopped up and the pieces are mostly removed from the final drug product. But this guy, a Mr. Kevin McKernan, claims that he has gotten some vials of COVID mRNA vaccine and has found contamination of plasmid DNA in the vaccine vials. 
at levels orders of magnitude higher than the regulated limit. Wow, this should be good. He has written up his results and posted them on this regulation-free preprint server, meaning that there's no safeguard, no peer review that even goes into what people can post on it. So it's not peer reviewed and it's not checked by anybody before it goes up. But that really doesn't even begin to describe the many problems with what he has presented here. So let's start with this. He writes that the COVID mRNA vaccine vials were sent to him anonymously in the mail without cold packs. <laughs> oh, wait, you're serious. Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> I could honestly end the video right here. That is really bad. This already violates the good documentation procedure of GXP guidelines. Not only do you have no idea who handled those vials before you receive them, but they're clearly not stored properly if they're not even sent on cold packs. Any self-respecting scientist would immediately recognize that this is not the right way to do this experiment. A competent and self-respecting scientist would make sure that they do the experiment right and actually have vials that have documentation so that they can show who handled them before they received them, that they were stored properly, and make sure that there's no funny business going on with whatever you're testing. But we're not dealing with one of those people here, and I'm not ending the video here. I'm going to be thorough and look at the results that they actually obtained with these mystery garbage vials. Let's go back to what I said earlier about there being tests to determine whether or not residual materials in your drug product are actually below the regulated acceptable limit. In order to demonstrate that, tests are done to quantify the levels of residual materials in the drug product. So the obvious question to ask here is, did Kev here actually quantify the levels of plasmid DNA in the vials? Well, he tried, but he didn't really. The key figure here in his blog post is this one. This is where he tried to make a standard curve. In actual GXP testing, you would want to have a standard curve made up of known values so that you can compare your unknown samples against it and actually quantify a value. So this is his attempted standard curve where he just ran some known amounts of DNA on a PCR and then on a seemingly separate PCR assay ran his material from the vaccine vials and just compared the two separate assays, which not good. You don't want to do that. You ideally want to compare them within the same assay, but there's a lot more wrong here. So let's go right to the meat of what is wrong. There's a lot of analysis missing from this standard curve. He just reports that this certain value came up around cycle 20 and seems to be fine with just mentioning that. So I analyze the data for him. Whenever you make a standard curve in a quantitative PCR experiment, there are several basic things that you really should do. Two of those basic things is calculating the linearity and efficiency of your reaction. Again, he didn't do that here, so I did it for him. The linearity of his standard curve looks fine, but the efficiency of the reaction is where you run into a problem. In any PCR, the number of molecules present should double with each cycle, and the efficiency of a quantitative PCR reaction is measuring that. It's measuring how efficient the reaction was. Usually in GXP world and just across the board, a range of 90 to 110% efficiency is considered acceptable. Kev's efficiency here was around 70%. There could be many reasons that a PCR's efficiency would be low like this, but normally those reasons would be ironed out when you're actually qualifying your standard operating procedure for your assay, which Kev didn't do. Now, because he didn't actually post his mean cycle threshold values, I didn't have precise numbers to plug into this calculator, but I judged as best as I could, and I was even as generous as possible with the decimal points, but no matter how much I played with it, I couldn't get the efficiency above 75%. So let's be generous and say that the efficiency of the reaction was 75%. In a GXP experiment, that would invalidate the entire experiment. So essentially his assay failed and his results are unusable. And there's good reason for this. If the efficiency is low, that means that the curves on this graph here are artificially shifted to the right, which means that you're not really measuring accurate numbers at all. 
Just for comparison, here are data that I pulled from one of my experiments. You can see that the efficiency is well within range and linearity is pretty good. This is a passing assay. This is a failing assay. Kev is trying to criticize pharmaceutical companies manufacturing processes while not being able to meet the standards of good manufacturing procedures himself. The theme from earlier when I talked about where the samples came from of just not taking the time to do this experiment the right way is a very consistent thread throughout this whole thing. And yeah, there's more, it gets worse. So already he's failed the good documentation procedures and now he has failed his actual assay, his experiment. But let's forgive that and move on and analyze the data further pretending like it's valid. Because remember, he claims to have found DNA in amounts that are orders of magnitude higher than what the regulatory limit set. So did he actually find that much DNA? Well, no, he didn't. Get ready for this one. In order to calculate how much DNA you actually have in your drug product, you have to do a few things. Once you have your standard curve and your unknown plotted against it, it depends whether or not your standard curve is measuring copies or gram amounts. Kev's standard curve here is in gram amounts, and that's fine. We can work with that. And so I did. I've put all the math involved here into a Google Excel sheet that you can access and look at yourself. It's in the description below, so go check that out if you want to check my math. But to make this as simple as possible, if I am as generous as possible, and I assume that all of the DNA copies that he has measured in this experiment are representing full-length intact plasmid, the total gram amount in a single dose of COVID vaccine would be 81 nanograms. So that's not orders of magnitude higher than regulatory limits. But we're not dealing with full-length intact plasmid here. Again, remember what I said about the manufacturing process, where after the mRNA is made, the DNA gets chopped up and mostly removed from the drug product. The DNA is going to be in pieces. So normally what people would do is look at the average length size of DNA in the final product. This can be done by doing what's called an electropharogram. Kev actually did one, and he shows that most of the DNA in the vial is fragmented. In fact, it's very short. About 100 base pairs is the biggest peak that he gets. The full-length plasmid is going to be on the order of 15,000 bases. So while Kev's own results show that most of the DNA is fragmented, he doesn't show an average base pair length, which is what you would use to calculate how much DNA you actually have. So I looked at some historical data for similar biological products and similar electropharogram curves, and I think 800 to 1,000 base pairs is a good average to estimate for average base pair length in this sample. I'll be generous and say 1,000 base pairs is the average length. So knowing that and knowing how many copies you measured in the actual qPCR reaction, you can calculate the nanogram amount of DNA, which comes out to 5 nanograms. That's about how much DNA Kev actually measured in this experiment that failed criteria on multiple levels and was done on mystery vials with no documentation history. And he thought that this was a big find. <laughs> okay, so moving on a little bit. Uh, that 5 nanogram amount, remember, that is me being as generous as possible with the numbers and also ignoring the fact that his qPCR efficiency failed, which means that his standard curve is actually shifted to the left, which means that his samples are going to be an even lower gram amount on that standard curve. So if this experiment was done the right way, you would probably get an even lower gram amount than what is shown here. So how do we know that Kev is wrong without even doing any of this analysis of his garbage data? We know because, again, regulatory bodies do this for us, and we've seen the results. For example, here's a summary of COVID vaccine batch release information from Australia. These vials were made by Pfizer, tested in-house by them, released by the regulatory body, and then went to Australia, and their regulatory body tested it themselves, and found that it passed all of the criteria. That means that all of the residual plasmid, the host cell DNA, the host cell proteins, the endotoxin, everything was below the acceptable limit, meaning that it was in trace amounts. In other words, practically nothing there. 
So either there's a global conspiracy among pharmaceutical companies and regulatory bodies all over the world, everyone's lying, or Kev just has no idea what he's doing. I think it's the latter. So you might think that that's the end of this video, but oh no, there's more. It gets worse. So after blogging about these findings, Kev went on to say that these findings have health implications. He went on to claim that a promoter, which is a DNA sequence that sits in front of a gene on DNA and helps the DNA actually get read by cellular machinery, is somehow going to cause cancer. Yeah, he thinks that a promoter is somehow going to get into your cell nucleus and integrate itself into your DNA and just happen to integrate in front of a gene that, if misregulated, would contribute to cancer. You know, this would be a pretty stupid idea if there were no evidence of random external promoters integrating themselves into your DNA. There isn't. It would be doubly stupid if we weren't regularly exposed to DNA viruses that have promoters in their genomes. We are. Just like anti-vaxxers who have come before him, who have tried to fear monger to the public about imaginary contaminations in vaccines, he's doing it again, and in a really bad way. So in summary, the experiments that claim to show DNA contamination in COVID vaccines are very sloppily done. Because they're so poorly done, they're not even considered valid by regulatory standards. And when we actually analyze the invalid data, we see that it's actually consistent with the levels being below regulatory limits. And on top of all that, what Kev has done might be illegal. According to federal law, COVID vaccines are the property of the federal government and can only be used, administered, or handled by approved bodies. I don't think that Kev's lab is an approved body for handling federal property. So, yeah, it might be illegal. More on that later, maybe. Anyway, that's going to do it for this week's video. That was pretty fun for me. And thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. If you've enjoyed this video, then don't forget to like it and subscribe so that you can catch me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.